After law school, I clerked for uh, the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court. And then after that, I was looking for a job. And so I got a teaching job at, uh, at Boston College Law School. And then I decided I wanted to get another degree. So the MPH, the Master of Public Health, seemed to be a good one, although at the time lawyers weren't eligible for it. Uh, and the financing mechanism to do that, the, the Joseph P. Kennedy Jr. Foundation had just released some funding in medical ethics. I didn't know what that was. But, but uh, Bill Curran, who I worked with, he was a health lawyer at Harvard at the time, um, you know, told me that was a good, good way to get money, and so I did. So I was, I was a, a Kennedy Fellow of Medical Ethics, although I did no medical ethics out here. Uh, we had one seminar, which Bill Curran taught with uh, Stan Reiser and Arthur Dyke. And I guess you could say that was ethics, although they were learning the field, the okay. same as we, we all were. That was 1971. Well, I was doing health law, and uh, it was mostly about law and medicine at the time. And I thought that. The people who needed the most help in, in law and medicine were the patients, not, not the doctors. You know? I had I was just literally going through a bookstore in Harvard Square, uh, and the new series from the American Civil Liberties Union had just come out. And they had the rights of, uh, of gays, they had the rights of soldiers, they had the rights to speech, but they didn't have anything in medicine at all. They didn't have the rights of patients. So, so I, I called them, and Norm Dorson, uh, who was the president at the time, invited me to New York, and I persuaded him that that was an important book to write and that I should write it. <laughs> and so that's the first book I wrote. You're right. yeah. I mean, there were some basic things from day one that I thought hospitals needed to do a much better job on. Informed consent, letting you pick whoever you wanted to stay with you 24 hours a day, wherever you were. Uh, you know, answering your questions, access to your medical records, things like that. Pretty, what we think of now today is pretty basic stuff, but at the time it was seen as radical. When my first child was born in 69, there was only one hospital in Boston who would let fathers in the delivery room. Just one. That was Cambridge, Cambridge City at the time. Wow. So that's pretty pathetic. And very different from the way things, things have changed. Are now. Th thankfully, things have changed. They've gotten slightly better and a lot more expensive. <laughs> I mean, the leading informed consent cases were actually I mean, two Canterbury versus Spence and Cobbs versus Grant, which were both decided in 1972. So around the same time I started working in this field. So that was nice. Coincidence, so I, you know, the first commentators would either say, these cases are right, the judges are right, or they're just totally crazy. But mostly everybody said, as I did, that the judges were right. We had to figure out a way to implement this. So uh, could you say a little more about those cases for people who don't know more? Sure. I mean, Cobbs v. Grant was, was uh, like a pretty standard medical malpractice case of, in California. It got to the California Supreme Court. And uh, the question was, there was a malpractice case, but then the other question was, did the person understand what he was getting into? Did he know what the risks were of the surgery? This was a, a stomach ulcer surgery, and did he know that there could be complications, that he could lose uh, another part of his intestine, he could lose his spleen? And he was not told that. And the surgeon said, well, I didn't tell him that, because nobody tells him that. Well, we surgeons, kind of, it's custom in the trade. We don't tell patients about the risks because then they won't get the surgery. And they, we know that they have to have the surgery. <laughs> so, so, and uh, the court was not impressed, basically. The court said this is not a matter like how you cut, what kind of incision you do. Those are things that you guys, medical profession, you guys get to you set your own rules on that, your own usages. But here we're talking about your obligation to the patient. And it's the law that's going to set that, not you. And the fact that none of you tell the patients anything is not meaningful. It just means that you're, you know, you're all doing the wrong thing. And the court decided that it was the nature of the doctor-patient relationship, that it was a fiduciary or trust relationship that required the doctor to disclose certain information before he or she asked for permission to, for the surgery, for example. And you know, they argue to this day, well, what kind of information? And the court right there said material information by which they meant information that might lead the patient to make a different decision, to say no. That's exactly the kind of information the doctor didn't want to give up. <laughs> if I told them the risks, they wouldn't take the surgery. Well, that's the, then you know you got to tell them that. That's what you got to tell them. So that's you know, been the basis for the legal doctrine of informed consent since, since the early 1970s. It's still based on the fiduciary nature of the doctor-patient relationship.
But the rights of hospital patients also stresses the need for patient advocates, which seems to me is a, is a big step beyond just the issue of informed consent. Well, it is. I mean, that, that there's both the theoretical, you know, what rights do you have, and then much more practical, how could you, is it possible for you to exercise those rights? And the truth of the matter is, I mean, when you're sick, when you're really sick, uh, you're in no position to exercise any of your rights. It's really true that, as people say, you're not yourself. You're really not yourself, literally and figuratively. Um, and the last thing you really think about is exercising your rights. You want it. You want the pain to go away. You want someone to help you uh, get through whatever this is that you have, and that's number one. And and it really blocks out everything else. So I do do think and have from the first day that you need someone else. Who I call an advocate to help you navigate that system in the hospital. You know, and I think whoever that person is, they should be with you 24 hours a day. And I've more recognized as the years go on that that's a. You know, I don't want to put guilt trip on people. Some people just can't stay 24 hours in the day. You know, some people have other family uh, obligations. But, but in so far as you can, it's really important to have someone there. And, you know, not just for, for rights, but also for safety. By the mid-70s, you were starting to write about human experimentation. Mm -hmm. You published a book in 1977 with Leonard Glantz on uh, informed consent to human experimentation. What started taking you down that road, and what did you hope to achieve with that book? Yeah, I mean, there's a chapter on human experimentation in the rights of patients, obviously, uh, and that was, they're very closely related. Uh, we wrote that book, I mean, that book was written for the National Commission. It was uh, outside of the psychosurgery chapter. All the other chapters were written as informed consent background papers for the National Commission's report. And Could you explain what that is? Yeah, the National Commission for the Protection of Subjects of Biomedical Behavioral Research, which was set up by Congress in 1973 as a result primarily of the Tuskegee experiments. And, and that commission was charged with drafting regulations, actually first, last, and only commission that had that specific charge. And as part of their, of, of their work, they needed, well, we thought they needed, and we convinced them they did, um, some very serious work on informed consent, because that, that was, for us, that was kind of the key to uh, protecting human subjects, so giving them the, the tools they needed to protect themselves, basically, through informed consent. So we uh, argued to, to them, and I think it was right. I think Leonard probably has, was, Leonard Glantz was probably most uh, influential in setting up this notion that, you know, the Nuremberg Code talked about informed, voluntary, competent, and understanding consent. And uh, we argued that those different things are, are, are more or less important in different settings. Like for the competent person, it's informed, obviously you want to be voluntary, com voluntary uh, and competent as well. For the men patients with mental disabilities, it's the incompetent, the competent part. Uh, for children, it's also the competent part. Uh, and, uh, and for prisoners, it was the voluntary part. And that, you know, you could set up, you know, a, a whole look and look at these different categories, which the commission wanted to look at uh, by emphasizing different parts of the doctrine of, called informed consent for short, probably better to call it informed choice. But, yeah. And so we did, and we sold the commission staff, Michael Yesley, on that, and, that's, and then we wrote it, wrote it for him. Kind of strangely, uh, maybe not strangely, but maybe predictably, uh, research on prisoners has essentially ceased. <laughs> Even though there are regs on that, they're, they're very difficult to get to navigate in most prisons. Just don't do prison research at all. And research on uh, people with mental disabilities, those regulations were never passed. Mm -hmm. To this day, we don't have those regulations. That was, that's very difficult as well. That was, it turns out to be too difficult. For anybody, and it's been tried a number of times in the past 30 years, and uh, we still don't have regulations. And it's because there's a fight between people who want to encourage research on their family members with severe mental illnesses and people who want to protect them from the researchers. <laughs> and you know, I th I think they both have the, the welfare of their of people with mental disabilities. We just don't know a lot about how to treat people with mental disabilities. I don't know that research would help. I mean, some research would. But yeah, so that's a big problem now. We still can't even do 
parity with mental health, let alone take care of people with mental health problems. At some point along about 1980, you um started to kind of see yourself as being in the field of bioethics. 1975, if you wanted to. I mean, I'm, but that's when I started writing for the Hastings Center Report, which even though I wrote a law column for it, it the journal is entirely bioethics, so I couldn't escape being labeled as a bioethicist, or at least a health law bioethicist. After uh, I persuaded, I did persuade Dan Callahan that what he, he really needed something about the law in that journal because uh, that's what was running bioethics and still is. Uh, and he didn't take that much convincing. He took a little bit convincing. But, but he was fine. And, then, and I wrote every issue in the Hastings Center for 15 years. And that's when people know me as a bioethicist. They think of me from that writing in that particular place. And at the time, that was the only journal. Now there are lots of bioethics journals. But from 75 to 90, I don't think there was really another one. As you began to think more about bioethics, how did that change your relationship with law and how did it change your relationship with the work you did? Yeah, I mean, it's, that's a good question. I think just, you know, just as bioethics asks a lot more should questions and law hardly ever asks, answers, asks should questions, it just asks must questions. What must you do? What do you have to do? Not to be an outlaw. Uh, I think it broadened my work, yeah. I was, I was able to look at things where it was clear the law was not going to make a big difference one way. But that ethics could still change behavior in ways the law couldn't. So I just think it broadened it. I don't think it was, I never thought of it as uh, being confrontational or antithetical. And I also found it always quite amusing that almost every big time bioethicist ultimately wanted to go to the Supreme Court and get a decision <laughs> of whether it was about abortion or whether it was about, you know, physician assisted suicide. All of all the big fighting questions they wanted to resolve in court, which was because they couldn't resolve them themselves, of course, because they really are complicated questions. So the best we can do at some point is say, "All right, you can do. You don't have to do any of this stuff, but it's legal if you want to do this." So you mean the moral imperative, as opposed to the legal imperative, was driving a lot of people toward the courts? If they wanted an answer, yeah, yeah. I mean, we weren't going to resolve the abortion debate, for example. That that has plagued bioethics from the beginning. And Dan Callahan actually got it right back in 1972 before the court decision. He said that abortion will become legal. The question is whether it will remain a moral issue or not. And to many people, it hasn't. Some people have. You know. But I would say not the most. What do you think was the most important sort of moral issue in your early years in bioethics? Oh, that's a good question. I think it's the same one it still is, which is... Um, decent access to medical care and uh, being treated with respect and equality. That, that's been our major issue in American medicine forever. And we still don't do very well with it. I understand that you also for a time ran a bioethics camp. Yes, well, we started bioethics summer camp. That's true. That still goes on. But, uh, mm -hmm. oh, where and how did that work? Well, I mean, it wasn't just me. There were, there were a number of us thought this was a good idea. Uh, uh, we actually, the first one we did was in Lutzen, Minnesota. We picked Lutzen because Art Kaplan was still at the University of Minnesota. <laughs> so, so Art and I, I ran that one. And then the second one, we, we ran in Nantucket because that's, that's where I was. Not in Nantucket, but in Boston. And the idea was to try to get the BioSs together in an informal setting where they didn't have to threaten each other and just talk. The first one... Uh, we were, we were meeting over the summer the same time the Cruzan case came down from the U.S. Supreme Court. And so we wrote an article for the, the Journal of Medicine about that. And I, had, I really didn't think they were going to publish it, but they did. And basically what it said is, calm down, everything's fine, even though the court didn't do what we asked them to do. Uh, you don't have to, if you, whatever pr practice you're using now, you don't have to change it based on what the court did. And I think that was pretty important to tell doctors that because a lot of them thought, they needed writings now, they needed you know, specific wishes of their patients before they could withdraw treatment. If they weren't written down, they couldn't do it. So but that was good. And so it hasn't done that since then, but, but it could theoretically take positions because everybody was there. You know, I'm going to overgeneralize now, but most, most doctors, uh, I'm not going to say they're terrified of the law, but they want nothing to do with the law. So if there's two actions, one of which is more likely to keep them out of court or keep them from getting sued, and the other one 
may have a little more risk, they'll almost always take the one. And none of them have much risk, but yeah, stockers are major risk avoiders. And uh, and I can understand they're that they're, they're not they don't want to spend their life in court. They don't. Want to know. It's a whole foreign area to them. It's like me going into an operating room. I don't care for that either. But that's not my natural. It's their natural environment, so they're happy going in an operating room. Most people don't want to go there. The courtroom is kind of my natural place, even though I don't go very often. But I'm very much at home there. They're not at all, <laughs> unless they become, you know, professional expert witnesses. Some do, but thankfully not many. Yeah. So they no, they really don't want it. They don't like it. They don't. Want it. I mean, you can see it in medical marijuana. Most doctors want nothing to do with medical marijuana. They don't care if it's legal. As long as the DEA is hanging out there somewhere and they're not sure what they're going to do, they just don't want, don't want to deal with it. Even if their patients could really use it, they're not dealing with it. At the beginning of my career, I used to tell doctors they don't take the law serious enough. You know, when we had the doctor of informed consent or the law was clear on it, they still took them years and years to internalize that and take it seriously. And a lot of them still think of it as a form rather than substance. You know. Um, and, you know, confidentiality, patient confidence, so, you know, a whole, whole list of things that doctors may not have taken that seriously. Now I tell them, not, not that, sometimes they take the law way too seriously. The law the judges really are their friends, whether they like it or not. They do want to support them as long as they do things that are reasonable. I mean, they got to go, you got to go way off, you know, what you might call standard medical care uh, before you can get in any legal trouble, as long as you're acting in good faith and doing something that's consistent, at least, with good medical care. That's really all you have to know about the law. And I actually tell them, I've been teaching medical students for 40 years. I, that's what I tell them. I don't believe that uh, in defensive medicine. There's Every economist who's tried to document that basically concludes that it happens, but it only happens because doctors get the bill for it. They get extra money for doing the extra tests. As soon as you stop paying them for the extra tests, they stop doing them. It's almost that simple. You know? And the doc, if you talk to the doctors, they'll say, yeah, we do what we get paid for. If you don't like us doing this, stop paying us for it. <laughs> That's what we tell insurance companies, too. Now, this whole overdiagnosis notion. And uh, the doctors are testing. Of course, they get paid to test it. And, and it doesn't hurt them. It hurts them if they miss something. It never hurts them if they did an extra test. So, yeah, the financial incentives, and if you want to say the legal incentives, too, are very perverse in medicine. It leads us to this kind of weird system or more is better when more is not better <laughs> more means more problems usually well I mean like many people started with Karen Quinlan you know, that was kind of the shocking case for everybody and no one ever seen that before that, that, that someone on a on a ventilator whose parents wanted her off with doctors wanted her off and they wouldn't take her off that just seemed wrong to everybody and it got into the papers and it got into the court system and and it was almost something you felt you had to write about to you know, comment on this because it's the first time a court, a Supreme Court had ever looked at this situation. Uh, and then it turned out that that wasn't the end of it. That was the beginning of it. So I was, I was in this situation starting in 75 where I had agreed to write a, an essay every two months. And for the next 15 years, there weren't more than two or three times that it was hard to figure out what to write about, just because of what was going on. You know, either what was in the Supreme Court, what was in a, on the way up to the Supreme Court, what was going on with medical technology. I mean, I did for a while become fixated on uh, the artificial heart, for example. I spent a couple of years on that. Tell us about that. And it was, uh, well, I mean, first, Barney Clark, the person who got the first artificial heart, and, and Bill DeVries became like, Two of them, well, he, I always call him the, the most famous patient in the history of the world, by the second most famous after Karen Quinlan. But, but everybody knew Barney Clark. He was on the front page of papers all around, around the world. But the real star was his surgeon, uh, Bill DeVries. And it raised, that case raised all of the important issues on human experimentation. When, when, when can you do it? When, when is it acceptable to do something to a human being that was even higher up than most people had ever asked before. Um, and then how do you get informed consent for the first of its kind in the world? It's something that's as strange as this, you know, and uh, and ultimately, as, as you may remember, the, the Utah IRB was, we we're also looking at IRB systems, and the Utah IRB was, it's fair to say, it was just horrible. I could hardly get a worse IRB. And that they refused to make the decision. They ultimately said, well, it's too hard. 
<laughs> Let's leave it up to Barney Clark. Well, kind of a ridiculous thing is that to say, but that's basically what they did. And we will only give permission to do what? Then you come back to us after you do Barney Clark and do another one. We'll see if we give you permission to do another one. I mean, how weird is it? I mean, it was unprecedented. I give them credit for that. But nonetheless, I think they handled it very badly. And, and when, um, when Bill DeVries came back after Barney Clark uh, had died, and you can argue whether it's success or failure, uh, the IRB really didn't know what to do because they had no guidelines on how to do a second one. So ultimately, as you may or may not, why would you remember? Uh, Humana, not for pro uh, for profit hospital chain, said, Bill, come on down to Nashville. We'll let you do a hundred of these things there. You don't have to worry about the IRB. And so his IRB was screwing him around so much, he decided, fine. He picked up and went to Nashville, where he actually did four more. And that was the end of it. But he had permission from the FDA to do seven, which was kind of like a magic number. You know? Biblical number. <laughs> I don't know to where they got the seven. It doesn't, doesn't mean anything in terms of, of math or statistics. But, but um, you know, the F, he didn't have to go back to the FDA until he did a series of seven. But he quit at five, thank God, because it just wasn't going well. And, uh, and I spent some time, not only a couple of days with him, in Louisville talking through whether he should do any more. And he, I think, had already decided he wasn't going to do any more. <laughs> or, or his boss, Lansing, had decided he wasn't going to do any more because the publicity had, had turned, you know, from radically uh, adulatory to, what are you doing to these people? Well, I think I learned a lot from that. Um, I never met Barney Clark. I met Bill Schrader. And, uh, and I learned there really are things that you should, I mean, I knew this intuitively, that you shouldn't do to other human beings. Should never ever ever, you know, tie someone up to a refrigerator for the rest of their life, uh, even if it's going to question you live or dead. Well, that's that's, that's too easy a question. All right? That's not the question. The question is, are you going to be alive in a very 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 compromised position or dead? I, I remember I, this was a long time ago, and I was still a baby. Maybe in the late seventies, I gave a talk in Australia to a group of neurosurgeons. And I told him, I mean, I made that argument, made my argument that there's something you just shouldn't do to a human being. Um, and, uh, and a lot of it was their research they were doing on these brains that kept expanding. And they were horrified. And I understand. I've, I've only given two talks in my life where people were absolutely horrified at what I said. There was, it was that group in Australia and the, uh, the cardiac surgeons in Texas. Tell us about <laughs> where that. Michael DeBakey was. Yeah, anyway, this one, afterwards... Uh, but everybody left. The one young, young neurosurgeon fellow came up to me and said, "You know, he said that's absolutely right. You know, but I can't. You know, it's just the stuff we do is horrible. But you know, we feel we just have to do it. Otherwise, we can't learn." I, I get, it. I get that. And anyway, what in uh, in Texas? I was talking about I uh, about a week, a month, maybe a month after. Barney Clark died, and so I was talking about the artificial heart, and that's like the home of the artificial heart there. Denton Cooley's there, you know, the inventor, and Michael DeBakey was, was there, and um, they ultimately just didn't want a lawyer talking about heart stuff, period. I also made a mistake. I mean, I said that they, you know, that I, I didn't find their cause of death credible, multiple organ failures, and that was my mistake. Uh, that, is a, that is a credible way to die, it turns out. <laughs> that's how he died. <laughs> So it isn't like that. And you can never, ever, 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 ever make a medical mistake talking to the doctors or you're dead. So I either try <laughs> to make sure I know what I'm talking about by talking to doctors before I talk to other doctors, or just don't talk about the medical stuff at all. One of the nice things about writing uh, for the Hastings Center, in that sense, is, is what I used to do is, is before, before any of my stuff was published, when I had the first draft, I'd send it to whoever I was writing about. And not always, but nine times out of ten, they'd call me and tell me much worse stuff than I'd written about them. But but also, I'd, I'd meet them later. I'd, I'd get to invite me to their conferences and they'd talk. And, and most of them perfectly decent guys. They just have blind spots. You know, they really do. And, uh, you know, my favorite was a doctor who did the baby fake case, Dr. Bailey. Um, 
And one of the things I said is, you know, you shouldn't be putting baboon hearts in babies until you put them in adults. And, you know, you should do it with people that can consent. And he never really got that. I mean, we were at a conference once together. He said, oh, wait, wait a second, wait a second. Let me get this straight. You mean I have to wait for somebody to do a baboon heart in an adult before I can do it in a kid? He said, I only do kids. <laughs> I, said, yeah. I said, that's exactly right. You got that exactly right. No, he never did another baboon just because it didn't work. You know, not because he wasn't willing to do a bunch of baboons. He went on to do anencephalics after that. And the horror of that was that the first one he did worked. I mean, he was... I mean, I'm not one to judge, but he was clearly a gifted surgeon. He could take like a, a heart smaller than your thumb, take it out of one baby, put it in another baby, and it would keep that kid alive. Unbelievable. I mean, who could do that? But um, but the, the tragedy of that one is that unlike the baby fave with the baboon heart, which was clearly never going to work again, it didn't work the first time. This one worked the first time, and then never worked again. But they kept trying and trying, and finally they gave up. But... And for a while, it was very hot. Even the AMA said, oh, we should take hearts from anencephalic babies and transplant them. <laughs> and that, that actually led to one of my best lines. Actually. The question wasn't whether the baby had a brain, but whether the AMA had a brain. They didn't like that. But it was true. They changed their, they changed their policy the next week. I said, no, no, you're right, you're right. We don't want to do anencephalic brains. It's a mistake. So in the sense that you were trained first as a lawyer and yes. medical students have their training first as, a, as doctors, when you teach medical students, what do you say to them? Well, the nice thing about medical students is they're much closer to being patients than they are to being doctors. And they know it. <laughs> I tell them that. So they're really, they're at that, they're for, I usually get in my first or second year, and it's changed over the years. We go back and forth, first year, second year. Uh, the best time to get them actually is in their residency, but it's just too hard to schedule. Uh, so, so no, medical students, I've never had, I mean, some medical students just won't listen to the law, but most of them are great. I, I love medical students, unlike many of my colleagues. Uh, so I've always enjoyed teaching medical students. And I still teach them. I've been mean, teaching them since 1974, however long that is, every year since then. What do you call the course that you teach them? It's, it's called Law and Medicine. Uh, actually, it, technically, we change it to the rights of patients and their providers. That's what I call it. <laughs> and so I still think patients' rights is the most important thing for them to learn, not their patients actually have rights. And they see it, again, in their first and second year on their patients. <laughs> you know, or, they're, or they're thinking about their parents or their grandparents, you know, what they've been through or what they're going through. You know, so it's, yeah, they can identify with that. Once they get out, you know, I mean, residency is tough on anybody. Then it's just getting the work done. <laughs> not having much time to reflect on what's happening. But if you can get them then, then they have a real problem. They understand, oh, yeah, geez, you know, how do we do this? Is there a way we can help this person either end treatment or get treatment? Yeah. Yeah. Very practical oriented. Let's talk about um, some of the other issues in, that you dealt with starting in, the, in probably the 1980s or so. Genomics. Let's talk about genomics and your approach to issues raised by genome sequencing, et cetera. Yeah, well, I probably got involved in that coincidentally again in, uh, when I was running the Center for Law and Health Sciences at Boston University Law School. That center was run uh, primarily, I mean, it was there before I got there, primarily to do multidisciplinary seminars that were open to all the graduate schools in the Boston area. It was great. I mean, mostly it was, it was MIT, Harvard, uh, Brandeis, uh, MBU, MBC. And we had seminars on really interesting subjects, including human experimentation, death of dying, and, uh, and one on genetics. And the genetics one was actually quite accidental because uh, Seymour Letterberg from Brown University had just talked Harvard into letting him take first year law school. And he did that. He didn't, you know, he didn't want to be a lawyer, so but he wanted to learn how lawyers think. Very interesting. So then after he did that, he came over to see me and he said, well, what can I do with this? <laughs> and I said, well, one thing we could do, we could teach a seminar. You can teach me genetics and I'll teach you the law. And uh, so we did. For five years, we taught a sure it's the first seminar in the United States on the subject of genetics and the law from uh, 73 to 78. And it was great. I'd see, I'd see more and I stayed friends till his death a few years ago. Yeah, he was terrific. 
He says, you'll always be known as Joshua's little brother. Though. And that must be very frustrating. <laughs> but yeah, so that's, so I got, I got started with Seymour and then um, I had an interlude with Aubrey Malinsky, who was not a pleasant person. And then I met Sherman Elias. Actually, Sherman Elias came to see me and uh, Sherman and I worked together for more than 30 years and wrote a couple of books together. And, uh, we were just finishing up another book, which I'm finishing now, when he died. But Sherman was, Sherman was one I really did clinical genetics with. And he was, he was an obstetrician geneticist and front, front of his profession. And, and we did a lot of work together, both for the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and he was high ranker in there. And then we were both on the ethics committee of the American Society of Reproductive Medicine. We, we did a lot of the early, early work on ethics for them. We had finished a book called Reproductive Genetics and the Law, um, and which was really before a lot of the so-called new reproductive technologies or assisted reproductive technologies um, had started to be used in the clinic a lot. And uh, so there was a need, and the profession felt it. And it became a subspecialty. Uh, assisted reproduction and the IVF, especially in vitro fertilization, and turned out it made an awful lot of money. So a lot of the centers were, were spun off and they were independent. Some of them were, like, like at, at Northwestern where, where Dr. Elias was, uh, were part of the obstetrics department, but they had their own building. And stuff. Uh, so they understood that they, you know, since there would never been a research phase with IVF, no, there were no standards about what to do or, at all. And that's because this weird thing, the federal government would never fund embryo research. You couldn't create or destroy an embryo in research. So, so you couldn't study IVF. How nuts was, I mean, that, that's insane. That was one of the major bad results of the abortion dispute. So they had to kind of make it up as they went along. They probably wouldn't say make it up, but they would say, we had, to, we had to set our own standards, and then, and they did. So they did, and they also knew they needed some ethical standards. Although, you know, there's a split, like there's many, but there were a lot of libertarian IVF guys who would do whatever the patients wanted to do because they thought that was their right. They learned learned a little bit about informed consent and patients' rights. So what they learned was patients have a right to this stuff. <laughs> and uh, I don't know why I laugh about that. It's so true. And then there, and then there were others. Well, we need some you know, some guidance at least, you know, the, the, the basic rule when you're making ethical standards for a medical professional group is that you never say never. You know, the bottom line is, well, no matter what, if the, the, both the doctor and their patient agree on this and you get informed consent, you can probably do it. <laughs> so, you, know, you know, maybe it's a little iffy. We, so the, the word we use that often is this should not be encouraged rather than you should not do this. <laughs> Never ever would the, could the group vote to say you should not do this. I said, no, not quite never ever. They vote, I did get them, I did not personally, but I pushed this a lot. This was also part of the big cloning debate. I think I did get them to say that. You should never do <laughs> human cloning to make a, a duplicate human being. My friend John Robertson, he is my friend, who was, was, was on the committee all the time I was on. He, he was the libertarian in this, he'd say, well, how can you say never? <laughs> what if it's the only way they could have a genetically related child? Which was his argument. You know, how, how can you harm that child? Because it wouldn't exist if, it, if we didn't use this technique. So we had those arguments a lot. But that was, I, I think that was one of the, certainly one of the most intellectually satisfying ethics groups I've ever been involved with. Even there, there were no ethicists on it. <laughs> it was, no, not quite. There was one or two. But it so, was, it's a subject matter that makes it ethical. It's not the people sitting around talking about it. So at the beginning of that period of I, IVF research, um, what was We're going to call it research. IVF clinical Clinical practice, practice sorry. <laughs> You're right. Um, what did ethicists talk about? I mean, did they talk about the practice or did they talk about the results, or did they talk about the fear of the results? Well, no, I mean, pretty basic stuff like, um, you know, who's the mother? Who's the father? Are there, are there any, does the child have any interest in this at all? Do we have to do anything? You know, do we do you keep records, for example, so the child can find out who is genetic? I mean, that was seen as really radical at the time, if you even think about doing that. 
mean, the uh, the standard in the in the practice with uh, artificial insemination by donor, which was came in uh, before that, was to burn the records as soon as the baby was born. So that would be impossible to figure out. But now we can do it with using DNA, but at the time they thought that was the right thing to do. I used to say it's the only procedure in medicine where the first thing you do is burn the records, which is true. Uh, so so it was families, really, you know, how do you, families, what do each one have a right to know? And then when you got into after baby M and surrogate, so-called surrogate motherhood, driving nuts. Uh, you know, what rights does each of the, you know, does the baby really have two mothers? And if so, how do you sort out those two? And now we're arguing about three mothers with mitochondrial DNA. Does the baby really have three mothers? You know, does the woman who gives the, the mitochondrial DNA have any, I, mean, I think that we're getting nuts there. You know, so, you know, contributing 37 genes makes you a mother. I mean, really. But we're having that debate in the United States and in England right now. There's the giant camp. You don't have to be a member of the American Society of Reproductive Medicine to do IVF and all these things. So they're the membership, which are perfectly happy with every, all, I mean, again, the rules aren't very onerous, they're pretty straightforward, with the ethical rules the society's put out over the years. And, you know, they don't just get approved by the ethics committee, they have to be approved by the governing council, too. Uh, and then there's a few, I might want to call them outliers, I wouldn't call them, but they do think of themselves as hot shots, cutting edge, who, uh, who just do their own thing. And they're not members of the group, so they don't have, they don't necessarily even come to their annual meeting. And uh, those are the ones you read about it. <laughs> One of them was presenting at the national meeting, the neurology meetings of all places, just a couple of weeks ago, said that she'd figured out how to do genetic screening of embryos to see whether they had, were affected by an early Alzheimer's gene without telling the mother whether she was affected by this gene. So that's the newest thing, right? I mean, one, we have one camp. <laughs> In, in genetics trying to say, you have to know all about your genes. If we're gonna test one gene, you have to test 56. <laughs> and you have another camp say, no, we will figure out a way. So you don't have to know anything about your genes, even if you wanna know about the genes of your babies and your embryos. What's your position on that? Uh, well, my position on the first one is that it should, it should be informed consent, for sure, on uh, the 56 genes, whether you wanna know them or not. And then, and, and they've backed off on that, the American Society of Human Genetics has, has said they got carried away, basically. They didn't put it in that way. But, but this one is, uh, you know, I don't understand it. I don't understand how you could do something to your children. They're going to be your children. Without taking the responsibility to do it yourself. I mean, I have this whole problem with... Uh, and with human experimentation, too. I, for example, think if you're going to do an experiment on a kid that could hurt him, you have to be in the room for the whole experiment. Because that kid can't say no anymore. You've got to be there both to guard the kid, but also to say, stop. You know? And we say, feel the same way about disabled you know, people with disabilities. Uh, that uh, Two rules on that. One, you ought to be there whenever you do research on them so that you can quit and, and protect them. And the other one that you can't, under no circumstances, can you use restraints. And if you need restraints, you shouldn't be able to research it. And it's, it's analogous to this. I mean, it's just, you know, you do weird things. I spent a lot of time, not anymore, but I used to spend time with the transhumanists. <laughs> a lot. I love my transhumanists. I mean, they really think that they're going to migrate into a different stream of consciousness, either, you know, upload their brain into a robot body or just become particles and roam the universe. In any event, uh, when it comes down to research they want to do, they all want to do it on their kids. <laughs> so, you know, my position is always bad. You want to research on yourself, knock yourself out. Uh, you want to research on your kids? No, I'm not going to let you do it. If I have anything to say about it, you're not touching your kids. You know, you want to paint yourself green and sparklies and, you know, go into a machine and, <laughs> and go into particles, that's fine. But just stay away from your kids. And I feel saying, I mean, embryos aren't kids, but I feel, you know, you're doing it because you're going to make a kid here. Yeah, take some more responsibility for that. But, but this, there are a lot, there's a lot of people who want the doctors to take all the responsibility, and the doctors should resist that. No, we're not doing that. It's not just a consumer good, you know. It's not, actually, medicine means something. And, and that's, ultimately, that's the goal. That's the, the issue here. Does it mean anything, or has IVF just become a consumer good? How do you think that larger issues of class play out in 
assisted tech reproduction. Oh, well, you know, I mean, just reproduction almost in most states, not I mean, we have an we're exception in Massachusetts, but it's all self pay. I mean, it's one of the things few insurance companies cover and uh, Medicaid used to cover it, but um, we had scandals. Of, and anyway, uh, you know, it's, it's like totally dominated by rich and upper middle class white people. And how do you feel about that from an ethical perspective? Oh, I think that's highly problematic. Though. Yeah, I mean, if it's a good thing, well, I mean, oh, it's, it's still debate whether it's the practice of medicine. I mean, Dan Callahan, you know, always say it's, it's kind of a strange disease that you could cure by divorce and remarriage. <laughs> and <laughs> got a little <laughs> dismissive there, but nonetheless, uh, it is a strange disease. It's not really a disease. You're not, he used to say, to, he's unkind. You know, nobody's died. <laughs> it's always sorry. Yes, of course it's not, you know, but you have adoption or other ways you can have children. And it's a good question. Where is this, this fixation on a genetically, a genetic link to your child? Because it doesn't have to be a link of two parents. It's happy with just the link of the male, obviously. So, yeah, I have always found that a little bizarre. Although the other day I say, well, it's easy for you to say you've got a boy and a girl. It's true. So what? I mean, you could say about any disease, right? Most people don't have it, so can't disqualify you from talking about it. But yeah, IVF is, uh, that whole reproductive technology has always been seen as something separate. And in many ways it is. And it's not, you can blame it all on the abortion debate if you want to, because that's where it started. But, but it's still separate. And then we, you can get carried away and say, well, does the world really need more children? <laughs> you know, what are we doing here in the first place? And especially when you see them you know, we're getting, if we're not there already, we're very close to having most of the IVF clinics in the world are in China. And the second most are in India. Yeah. Because yeah. we keep forgetting there are lots of rich people in China and lots of rich people in India and lots of them are infertile and want babies. Mm -hmm. and, and their countries are so much bigger than we are that it doesn't take much for them to have more IVF clinics. Very interesting. It is interesting. And a lot of them were started by, <laughs> by Americans. That's true too. Michael Groen and I, um, started doing work on, and we decided, I don't, I mean, you really don't even remember, I should remember how we, well, we decided we wanted to do some work on the Nuremberg Code, you know, we wanted to work on Nuremberg. Michael's an expert on the Holocaust. Uh, I didn't know anything about most of this stuff, but uh, I thought that was a good project. Uh, and when we began, we thought the first thing we should do is get a list of all the books that were written about Nuremberg. <laughs> turned out, and we thought there were about a hundred. Uh, it turned out there were two. Uh, and one was in French, totally in French, and the other had been translated from the German. But that was it. I mean, not that it, well, nobody really cared about it enough to do any work on it. Uh, uh, Harvard had the uh, original typeset of the transcript of the doctor's trials. So we went over there to look at that, and he kept it in a sub-basement, and no one had ever looked at it. During a the flood, they once took all the documents and put them on top of the filing cabinets. So we thought it was a good project. So we spent, we spent a lot of time on that, and we you know, wrote a book about it, did conferences on it. And at one point, Jonathan Mann, who was, we know as a father of health and human rights, uh, was at Harvard and invited me over to give a talk uh, on Nuremberg. And I did. I was happy to go over. I happened to meet him one there. And I told him, I didn't know anything about human rights. And he said, Actually, that's not true. <laughs> not just Nuremberg, but all my work on patients' rights, he said he sees that totally as human rights stuff. I never did. Um, but after that, I started working with, with Jonathan, and, uh, and I started getting more involved. I, I started learning. I didn't know any of this stuff. I, didn't, I literally, at the time, did not know what the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was. Most Americans still don't. But, um, and I didn't know the whole history of human rights. And all of that. So, so I started working in this field. Again, Jonathan named Health and Human Rights. I thought it made perfect sense, which is looking at these issues on a global platform and trying to figure out what the core of human rights and human dignity are that every person should have a right to. And then how do you do that? How do, you know, <laughs> implementation is much harder than theory, although theory is hard too. I mean, a lot of people still object to the notion that there are such things as human rights and many bioethicists just even don't understand human dignity. Uh, that's, you know, they think it's too European a concept. But, but anyway, that's, that's how I got involved. I'd give Jonathan Mann total credit for that. And Michael Groden, of course kept working on, the, on you, the Holocaust. Do you think that um, your interest in genomics, cloning, etc., had a connection to that development? 
Um, no, I think the clothing came later. I mean, I, I had been working on that. There was just, you know, some people, I guess I was involved in that too, thought that maybe a thing to do with cloning was to have a treaty, an international treaty. And I did some work on that. We played around with that for a while. It turned out it was impossible to do because of abortion again. Because uh, the Bush administration, they were obviously against making a baby cloning, making a, but they all, they didn't want to do embryo research either. Didn't want to make medicine with, with cloning. So they insisted that the UN outlaw both. And that just wasn't going to happen. So we didn't get a treaty at all. We could have got a treaty to, to ban human, what I call make a baby cloning, or dolly cloning. Uh, but we could not get a get agreement on, uh, for good reason, uh, doing research to try to make medicines. How about major events like uh, HIV AIDS? Did that have lead you in that direction also? No. Uh, yeah, no, it did. it did. This is embarrassing, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, Dr. Groden, uh, my colleague Michael Groden, was in my class in 1983, I think it was. Anyway, when when Grid was first described and developed, and he was trying to come up with a paper topic. And he wanted to do Grid, what was then known as Grid, but was going to be named HIV shortly thereafter. And I told him, don't do that. We'll have that figured out within a year. It's going to be a waste of time. And I obviously believed it at the time. So I had faith in medicine, too, <laughs> but uh, lots of it. But anyway, yeah, that became a bail, obviously a focus of our, our work for years and years and years. First domestically, because there were lots of problems in the United States with it, but then, then internationally, especially with the 076 trials. You know. And again, the regular issues of informed consent and exploitation and benefit, that's where we really worked about trying to say, if you're going to do a study, and what was basically an economic study, say we can't give everybody the, the drug because it's too expensive. Well, then you're doing an economic study. You're not doing a medical study. So you've got to have an economic output. Boy, did that bother people. Could you say a little more about that? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I gave a number of talks around that time. And I remember one of the first ones was at, was at Harvard uh, to the researchers there who were doing mostly HIV AIDS research. And, and the question let me, let me get this straight. Do you mean that when I apply for a grant now, I have to include an economist in there to come up with a plan to how I'm going to make this? <laughs> I mean, it wasn't that he was objecting to the idea. He was objecting to having to add another person on his grant. <laughs> yeah, it was like the least of your worries. You know, I was trying to figure it out. I mean, how do we do this? I mean, Ebola now takes us in. Right, you know, we now know how to cure Ebola. Now, we're not going to put biocontainment units in Africa. But you could ask why not. Well, it's too expensive. They're not gonna, but, but, you know, you can't miss the double standard of treatment. You, you know, I just can't miss it. And it certainly wasn't intentional, but we now have a situation where we've cured every white person in the United States and killed the two black guys that came here. Well, we, said we didn't mean to do that. No, that's just the way this, our system works. We don't mean to do it intentionally, but that literally is the way our system works. So how do you deal with that? Boy, that's really not easy. I mean, there's a short term and a long term. I mean, the short term is you just got to get all the help you can get to West Africa as fast as you can get it. The long term is you're either going to help, you're either going to develop a decent system of health care there or, or we're not. And I think you have to. And that's why, and that's why another thing we have in our own NGO, Global Lawyers and Physicians, the idea to get <laughs> this group to work together on things like this. And, um, but right now, I think the, the best, and obviously Doctors Without Borders is beyond peer and actually delivering services. But Paul Farmer's Partners in Health has got the right idea, though. You can't do it on an emergency basis. You've got to build sustainable, Healthcare systems, and they've got to be run by the people there. You do. Now, that having said that, that's not that easy, but it's the right goal. That's absolutely, totally the right. That's ab he's absolutely right. And, uh, and I love Paul. What's the goal of your organization, and um, how does it fit within that larger pattern? Well, our goal really is to get to get the you know, doctors and lawyers to work together, under the theory that they're both transnational professions. Governments can't can't work together. Governments can't work together. Period. <laughs> you need something on top of that. And the NGO community. If we didn't have the NGO community, of course, we'd have nothing going on in Africa right now. Uh, but uh, 
But NGOs have a problem too. They have a structural problem. They, they don't work together ever. They're almost like, yeah, even, even you know, Doctors Without Borders have already been split off into two groups. They can't even work with each other. You know, the doctors of the world and Doctors Without Borders. So they don't. So one of the things, we with two things with, with GLP. One, we wanted to get doctors and lawyers to work together. And we've been marginally successful with that. The other one is about to get NGOs to work together. And that turned out to be so much harder than getting doctors and lawyers to work together. But for a couple of years, we managed to get the big groups in Boston, Physicians for Human Rights, Amnesty International, Northeast, uh, IPPNW, Physicians Against Nuclear War. And we meet every month and try to coordinate our activities. And again, that worked for, that did work for a couple of years, but in the end, they, they really, NGOs don't have any interest in working with others. They do not play well with others. So there's big problems. I mean, I, I'm not a secret, there are big problems internationally, but but that's where the action is, and you got to do it. You know, ultimately, we have to come up with some global consensus, and that's you can it's easy to say well, that's impossible. And you, know, you got to do it. You gotta, even, even for no other reason than this thing I've called ethical arbitrage that uh, companies or venture capitalists or people who want to do weird things can just find the country with the most loose rules, which is many countries without any rules. Just go there and do it. And who's going to stop them? And the answer is nobody. That's a big problem if you think that there are such things as yes. ethics and, uh, and principles and, you know, mean something to be a human being and there's some things other humans shouldn't do to other humans. What kinds of companies do you have in mind? Virtually all the small biotech companies who want to make something weird. Not, I mean, George, people like George Church, who I love George Church, I'm not trying to pick on him, but he probably, he's so smart, he's probably involved in 50 different companies. He doesn't know what they're all doing, but they're all trying to play off of his ideas. And they would figure, well, if one, like most venture capitalists do, if one in ten of these hits, I'm going to be wealthy. So they'll try all kinds of weird things. And they may have nothing to get in their way. They don't have IRBs or anything. <laughs> they just do it. They have a bad dream and they go do it. I mean, the only, the only reason they can't do that as easily as they'd want to is they have to have, they, you do have to have some basic infrastructure to do most of these research. And some countries don't even have that. You do have to have running water. Or whatever. On the other hand, most countries have at least one major city that has a nice part to it and they have rich people. Yeah. So yeah, you can, you can go most places. Do you think that thinking about human rights and getting involved in human rights issues affected your thinking going back to your basic issues of patient consent, et cetera? Yeah, I don't want to see it as separate. I think it's, I mean, it's basic. It's a, it, I'd formulate it now as a human right, you know, right not to be touched, treated without your consent. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas I just thought it was a civil right at the time. Yeah. So it's locked into the American legal system where it's either a civil right or a constitutional right. Those are the only two kinds of rights there are, but now there are human rights too, which for most American lawyers is too vague. Which is why we were able to, why American lawyers were able to rationalize torture, waterboarding, indefinite detention at Guantanamo. All those things totally unconstitutional, illegal, immoral, violation of fundamental human rights. But American lawyers and doctors were able there to, to work together to torture people. It's a scandal that we still don't want to talk about. Well, I mean, after 9-11, you began to concentrate on these issues. I know? did. I did. I couldn't help it, I mean, because the, the country was changing. And not in good ways. And we haven't gotten over it. I, I did believe, this almost sounds like my HIV AIDS days again, I did believe that we'd get over it in a year or two. How naive is that? I really did. This is a bad pat. We're going to get through it. No, we still haven't gotten our way. If anything, it's just as bad now, maybe worse. Every day we get a new terrorist group we're worried about. Well, I mean, our tendency, whenever something horrible happens, is to think other things as horrible are going to happen and start thinking of everything in so-called worst-case scenarios, what I call worst-case bioethics. Just look at what's the worst that can happen. When that's like... Yeah, it may be the worst thing. It's not going to happen. I mean, those things don't happen. <laughs> Let's try to, you know, plan for the predictable, the likely, the things that, you know, we ask you want to spend 1% of your assets, start thinking about the worst possible things, like hit, getting hit by a meteor or getting, you know, 
blown up by a nuclear bomb. Fine, but you know, don't do your whole government, your whole life based on that. And that's what we're doing. And we are doing that. Cheney called it the 1% solution. And he meant it. He said, if there's a 1% chance something bad's going to happen, I want you to treat it like a 100% chance. That's pathological. That you should get locked up for thinking like that. But he didn't. He got to be vice president for eight years doing that. You know? Um, because on some level, Americans are real babies. They want to be. They want to. They want to be safe. We do not live in a safe world. And, uh, things happen. We know that. I mean, everybody's had things happen to their family members that they wished wouldn't have happened. They couldn't, that they couldn't protect themselves of against. But, but so we get to fundamental questions: What's life all about? What's government for? What things can you do to other human beings? You know, there's this whole movement to to make it very easy to quarantine the entire population if anything bad happened, right? And if there's good news, and there is some good news from Ebola, is even though you know, Governor Christie and Governor Cuomo flipped out, most people didn't. I mean, really, it was really. And even the doctor, even, I shouldn't say even the doctor, people are my friend. So the New England Journal, who I've spent as much time fighting with as I do a work to play nice with, really stood up and did, wrote that. I mean, I haven't seen a political editorial like that ever. I was saying, stop it. You can't spread Ebola until you, until you show symptoms. Don't overreact. And that was a very influential editorial. It did a nice job. And they're, yeah, they're right. Because we don't usually look at science first. We usually look at fear first. At least since 9-11. After World War II, we felt pretty good about ourselves. Since 9-11, we felt really bad. Now, it just makes me think back to what, what were my early uh, influences. And the first one, I didn't even mention, is the Vietnam War is clearly my first early influence. I spent many, many years trying to stay out of Vietnam, ultimately successful. But, but my, my early career was like fixated on that more than anything else. Um, in any event, the military medicine metaphor is one, you know, Doctors use unconsciously. I don't know. And uh, and you know, I can take no credit for the Susan Sontag. I think gets total credit for that. She gives some credit for other people too. But but it's true, as she pointed out. You know, the doctors are always fighting battles you know, on the front lines, using their armamentarium to wipe out the enemy <laughs> and all this. And as she pointed out, that makes your your body now becomes a battlefield. <laughs> And it becomes like an innate object, and then our job is to keep pounding on it and hurting it until it gives up its secrets or whatever it is. And that, and that's not good for anybody on either side, right? Because the problem with the military metaphor, as I've said, is it is there's no limit to it. It never has an end. You have to win the war. So you, no matter, even if you spend your country into bankruptcy, that's okay. That, that we'll get the money back later. You, you, there's not. There's, there's no other. Other possibility. It just, it just again makes us think in extremes, extremes of, of, of warfare, and life and death of your country. And the funny thing about it, I think, strange thing about it, it does not, even though we believe in it and live like it's real, it does not make us think that the government should run this thing. Now. We would never think, although we do a lot of subcontracts now, but we would, generally would never think of the army as working for anybody but the country. The healthcare system, though, no, we never think that would be terrible if the government ran the healthcare system. Right now. <laughs> that would be socialized medicine or something wrong with that. Uh, so the military metaphor doesn't go in positive ways, it just goes in negative ways, it seems to me. You know, and, and the most interesting thing, well, that's the most interesting, but an interesting thing about Ebola is ultimately, the whole world, to the extent they're involved, seem to agree that only the military could answer this call. President Obama said, you know, and, uh, and the president of Liberia asked her to get involved. In we'll send our military. We'll build you 17 hospitals. Nobody else could do that in a month. It took two months, but nonetheless, terrific. And then right away, England and France said, oh, I'm never really irritated that Obama beat him to this. We'll send our military too. That, you know, England's they reach to their own former colony, England to Sierra Leone and France to Guinea. So we have this weird thing set up. <laughs> it's a major global health issue, but it's all done by individual countries. And it's even individual aid to individual countries. 
there's no program for West Africa. There's a program for Liberia, separate program for Guinea, and then a separate program uh, for Sierra Leone. And so we haven't come very far in global health. <laughs> we still have the whole world is still very, very strongly based on the original UN charter idea that each country is a sovereign and no other country can enter that country without their permission. With the one exception being if the Security Council unanimously votes that it's a, an international problem, then we can do it. So if so this then, metaphor is so pervasive, how do you promulgate an alternative <laughs> one and what would be your alternative? Well, obviously it's not that easy. I mean, the alternative I suggested in 1994, that was a long time ago, uh, was the uh, ecological metaphor. And uh, it seems to me that does make some sense. Uh, and we do look at things like sustainability and natural, and we understand things go in cycles, things die, things live, other things are born, we have evolutionary trends. Um, all that seems potentially powerful, but you know, and so far in this world, we don't believe it. We don't believe in climate change, let alone we should take the environment seriously. But it could come back. I mean, it's going to be, it keeps saying it's going to have to get a lot worse before it gets better. But apparently it's so bad in China that they understand they can't breathe anymore, so they got to do something about that. So. And, uh, and we're, you know, on many of our coastlines, we're starting to see people quite upset that they're going to lose their property at some point soon. So. I don't know. It's uh, it's not easy. I mean, the military metaphor is wonderful. We love it. I mean, we use it not you know we use it for a reason. It it uh, you know it does what we want it to do. It gives us the authority to take very very drastic horrible things uh, to do things to patients with the thing. Well, but it's for their own good. We have to do this. Yes, it's bad. Uh, we're losing half our troops here. But that's it. we have to do that to win the war. We have to do we have to do this. We have to have to amputate all four limbs to save the patients. What we always say is, you know, I've studied a lot about the people who did the did Nuremberg, prosecuted the Nazi doctors, promulgated both the Nuremberg principles, but the Nuremberg principles, especially that there are such things as war crimes and crimes against humanity. People can be held individually accountable for committing them. And that I was just obeying orders is not a defense. After 9-11, we adopted all those things. So no, it's okay to torture if you have to do it for national security. Uh, in fact, we'll give you immunity if you do it. And you can always say you're just obeying orders whether you want to do it. The only good news about that I don't even know if it's good. I guess it is good news. Is the doctors and lawyers wouldn't do it unless they got immunity. <laughs> <laughs> so they knew it was wrong. I mean, they didn't know it was wrong. They really didn't want to you know, torture anybody or do anything. But they said, God, you get us, get us Justice Department lawyer writes it down that I'm immune from live. I can never be prosecuted for doing this. Then we'll do it. <laughs> so it's kind of a cold comfort to say that they at least understood the law. But in a very technical, dry way, not in a way, a self-protection way, rather than to say, no, this is stuff you should never do. That's what human rights law is. These are things you should never do to another human being. Murder, torture, slavery, genocide. Never. Never an excuse for that. Even in wartime, by the way. There's not. And, and one of the, I mean, it seems, it may seem not quite on, the, on point, but the, that list goes on. And the, the, almost the next thing on the list is experimentation without consent. That is a very hardcore human rights principle since 1966. I mean, it was since Nuremberg, we'd say, but it was actually incorporated in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights in 1966 and has been reincorporated in every major treaty involving that ever since. So, so that's, that's one you can't do either. And in fact, I think most Americans would have been even more horrified that we were experimenting on these guys at Guantanamo rather than we were torturing them to get information. Which is too weird because I think torture is the worst crime. The emphasis that you've put on this American failure because it was the Americans who wrote the code yeah. in the 1940s um, <clears throat> makes me wonder do you think that Americans have particular responsibilities in the arena of global rights and, and bioethics? 
I do, I do actually, and uh, uh, and when we used to too, right up till nine eleven, <laughs> we used to too. We used to too. We used to, I used to think we were the leader there. In fact, we used to get criticized for that. People say, "No, well, it's just all Western American ideals. These aren't universal ideals you're talking about." And we said, "No, no, these are universal." You know, and the Vienna Conference, nineteen ninety three, was all about that. All about all the countries that said, "Well, they were." They weren't universal. We gave them a chance to say, okay, so which ones don't you want to follow? And they went, no, no, no. <laughs> Even though, obviously, treating women with equality was the main one they didn't want to follow. But nonetheless, they would, they would say fine for the torture and the murder. But, yeah, no, it's, 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 uh, it's a shame. It's terrible that we kind of lost our, lost our, our, our desire to be leader. Here. And then kind of fell into this, what we saw as self protection. That we have to do this for, and then national security became the number one excuse to do anything. They so, have to do it for national security. The second one is saving lives, by the way, that, and that's what's always been used in medicine. The three, the big three are, as I'm sure you know, are national security, saving lives, and progress. You can justify just about anything in the United States with one of those. One of those goals, and if you can put any two of them together, <laughs> you're, you're unstoppable. My favorite one is saving innocent American lives. That's the best. No, I think what the Affordable Care Act shows primarily. I mean, we knew this already. Is how hard it's going to be to change the health care system to make something reasonable out of it. I mean, I'm not against the Affordable Care Act, but the idea that this is the end. <laughs> Once we implement this, we'll be fine. Is of course a fantasy. Right? Uh, I mean, right? Even this year, we've got if three percent of the total number of people become enrolled because of Obamacare. That's a lot. No, it's three percent. For those people, it's really, really, really important. That I'm, but no, the whole the system needs a total overhaul. And I actually think everybody knows that. But as, as Uwe Reinhardt has said in Boy, is he right? It's much more easy. It's much easier to, to talk someone into taking money to do some to something than it is to give money back or not to take money. <laughs> so, uh, as you said another way, you know, every dollar, every dollar of expenditure is somebody's dollar of income, and they will fight to keep it. And boy, they will. <laughs> it doesn't matter whether they do it anything useful or not. But, yes. So it's really you can't, it's hard to figure out how we're going to get rid of the insurance, the middleman here, the insurance company. Which are just making everybody's lives miserable, and and fun, <laughs> and getting paid for it. Uh, health laws become very, 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 very much entwined in uh, in the business of medicine. I mean that that we, that we have a whole group called the National Health Lawyers Association. There must be thirty thousand members of that, and they, they just do health law. But the health law they do, I wouldn't recognize. It's mergers, acquisitions, uh, employment contracts, uh, you know, retirements, uh, group practices, you know, all, all that, all that stuff. And that's just scratches the surface of it. Where it would overlap with ethics is we used to have a thing called ethics and compliance, and rightfully so, they got rid of the ethics a long time ago. It's just called compliance now. It's the fastest growing field there is. <laughs> In health laws, because because you, you know if you comply with federal regulations, uh, you can't get sued, and if you get sued, then you can't get triple damages from you. So they really it's like safe harbors. They just love they love that stuff, and that's mostly what health laws become. There is a s small subsection of medical malpractice law which continues about the same. It's always, and then there's a super subspecialties forensic forensic medicine, you know. Forensic psychiatry and forensic pathology, which is great. But yeah, so so health law has become business law, as and reflects the med the legal profession. I've talked mostly about the med, but the med the legal profession became a business years ago, and it, and that's much to its shame too. I mean, it's very very hard to find people interested. I should say they'll say interested in justice and, and fairness. I'm mostly interested in money, and that's. Too bad. Uh, Do you see that changing? No. <laughs> no, it'll change at the periphery. I mean, there'll be, you know, there'll be organizations. I mean, I actually think uh, it, it's kind of strange, but on balance, the American Bar Association probably does as good as any group to try to instill values to keep the idea of justice and equality alive in, in the United States.
which is strange because you don't you don't see that kind of thing on uh, professional medical groups. I see is much more business oriented. But that's because the lawyers don't need the <laughs> professional group for their business. They can do their business themselves, I think. You know, they, they need that is to say at least they have some soul left. That they really care about what they went to law school for, which really was justice and equality. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, bioethics very strangely has, uh, has started to shatter. I mean, a number of people have pointed out over the years that the, the thing that kept, kept bioethics together up till now was that they kind of agreed not to argue about abortion uh, because they knew that could split them up. Uh, but we had this weird thing it's still going on uh, last year where there became a di dispute about the support study, about an actual research project and whether they got informed consent or not. The support study was a study of uh, extremely premature newborns. And since 1950, 1950, wow, that's all on goes back. Uh, we have known, I'll talk about that, <laughs> the ecumenical, we, physicians have known if you give premature babies too much oxygen, they will go blind. Mm -hmm. And if you don't give them enough oxygen, they will die. But just exactly how much oxygen you should give them remains in dispute. So even though we still know those two things, so the study was designed to take half the baby, to randomize babies, randomize extremely premature newborns, 24 to 26 weeks, no, not 20, 26 to 28 weeks, uh, and give half of them so-called low saturation oxygen, and the other half high. Now, neither one, it wasn't really high and it wasn't really low. They're both kind of middle of the range, but, but one was considerably higher than the other one, right? And to make sure they got this all the time, they would, the instrumentation they have, the pulsimeter, they would break, they would put a, 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 uh, a damaged one in there. Not a damaged one, one that had been modified to get false readings, okay? So that the nurses and the doctors couldn't change the readings on these kids. So these kids, the one group would get the so-called high oxygen, the other get the low oxygen, right? Now, the argument was that if you go around the country to need an intensive care units, some units will be using the high ones and some units will be using the lower ones. So that they're both standard of care. So therefore, if you randomize between two standards of care, there's no additional risk to the babies. And you shouldn't have to say that there is. Okay, that's the argument. Now, this was reviewed by more than 20 IRBs. And all but one or two of them said, that's right, that's fine. You don't have to talk about how you randomize or that, you know, you might, you know, you might get in the group that gets the higher number of deaths, or you might get in the group that gets the higher number of blindness, even though that was clear to everybody. Um, but they had convinced themselves, I think they had convinced themselves, that, that everybody was doing the same thing they normally did, and all they were doing is figuring out a way to capture the data. In any event, Sid Wolf of uh, Public Citizen, I love Sid, I worked with him for many years too. Uh, analyzed the data and, and, public, and, and wrote a letter to uh, the Secretary of HHS and said that he thought this study was wrong, it was horrible. They were doing research without informed consent and they were not informing people and some of the kids had gone blind and we don't know who they are. Okay, I made front page of the New York Times, editorial in the New York Times. Uh, so the research community went kind of beside themselves and they, as did my editor, uh, at the New England Journal, where I've written for a long time, more than 25 years. <laughs> uh, and, and they wrote editorials and they had op-eds, and, and, but that's not interesting, that's fine. Uh, but what they also did is they got a, a group of bioethicists got together and signed, signed, like 25 of them signed a letter saying, this was fine, it was an outrage what Dr. Wolf did, everything in this study was fine. And after that letter was published then, Another group <laughs> got together and said, oh, this is horrible. <laughs> and it wasn't easy, but they got their letter published too. So you had this weird thing, which almost never happens. As far as I know, it never happened before. Oh, it, it did happen in the, um, in the physician assisted suicide cases. I guess when they went to the Supreme Court, there was a bioethics brief in favor of that and the bioethics brief. Again. But this is very unusual for the bioethics community to be split like that on a fundamental issue. I mean, informed consent, you can't get more.
four percent in research, in fact, which they're theoretically, if they're experts on anything, they're experts on that, you know, and they can tell IRBs what to do, et cetera. But anyway, they're split like this. It looked, I mean, it would appear to the outside world they're split 50-50. So your only conclusion has to be the bioassets have no idea what they're talking about. Really. Uh, and so the, uh, I mean, OHARP got all upset. They withdrew their letter. They had an all-day public hearing, uh, which is on tape, you can see. And they spent a year trying to figure out, well, they're gonna, what are they going to do about this called standard care research. And then last two weeks ago, they put out a new regulation, draft regulation, basically saying, yeah, you got to get it 4% for this. That's right. That is a risk. And you could, you, you know, it's not that either one is a risk, but you, the risk is you could end up with this one or that one. And, you know, if you really have a high preference between death and blindness, we should know about it. <laughs> okay. Um, that hasn't ended it. Uh, so uh, the New England Journal wrote another editorial saying this is all crazy. And they published another article by two bioethicists saying this is still wrong. The ILM is going to have a two-day meeting on this in, in two weeks. And it's still, it goes on. It goes on. So it may be... I'm trying to, th I don't think there's another case where the bioethics community has been so split as this. My own, I can see, even say this on tape, my own view is a lot of the bioethics jumped onto this without understanding it. Because it was like our thing at Lutzen in 1990. I said it never happened again. Actually, there was a meeting of the directors of bioethics programs going on at the same time this happened. And one of the members of the meeting put this letter together and got everybody to sign it. And I think if we talked to them individually and asked them if they had it to do over again when they signed this letter. My strong feeling, even though I'm, I didn't sign either one, uh, is that they'd say, no, we made a mistake. <laughs> At least we did not artfully frame it. What was your position on this case? Oh, my position. I mean, actually, my daughter and I have written a long law review article on it, so it's not a secret position that, that this, was a, a, this was part of a movement. And if I talk about trends, I actually think there is a trend to try to Marginalize informed consent. That's what I'd say. When you, you know, yes, informed consent is important, but in the real world, uh, we hardly ever get it and you shouldn't worry about it so much. In fact, if you go dig just a tiny bit deeper, they would say, for these, in these hospitals, which do st both of these standard of cares, they never get consent from the patients for that. They don't tell them whether they're doing the high oxygen or low oxygen, how much oxygen they, they just do it. They were taking care of your baby. And they would say, therefore, you don't have to do it for research. I would say, no, 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 they're making a big mistake there. They should all be getting informed consent. Not just, you know, that's really bad practice. And the fact you've gotten away with that is not any indication that you're doing the right thing. It's just that's what, you know, just that you happen to be getting away with it. And hopefully you will not be getting away with that forever. And that's why the, you know, the wolf thing just caused such a stir because the average person looked at that and said, you're not telling them that? What do you mean you're not telling them, little babe? And I mean, if you want to think you really get carried away, you can see that in many cases, some hospitals, the average age of the mothers was 17. First time they're ever in a hospital at all. And the first thing they're asked to consent to is this study? Really? I mean, I know it's important research, but you can't do it that way, I would say. You just can't, you can't ask them to consent to anything. If you had your absolute freedom to do it the way you wanted it, how would you design the consent process today? Would well, you redesign, how would you redesign okay. it, I should say? I mean, I mean, I can't take total credit for this because I've been, uh, almost everything I've done in my whole life has been done with Leonard Glantz, and I should say that, you know, because he's been my, I've been fortunate to have him as my colleague from the day I started working at the Center for Law and Health Sciences in 1972 to today. Right. And one of the things we talk about, and he's, we've tried to write about it, but nobody wants to publish it right now, is that the first thing you should just do away with the consent form. We're not the only, everybody knows the current consent form is dysfunctional. It's worse than that. All right, so most of the solutions are, well, let's make it a shorter form. Let's make it a, a three-page form, a five-page form, or I'd say one-page form. Um, but Leonard's idea, and I think it died, Michael Groden, too, involved in basis of You'd be better off without any form at all, because the four percent really was always supposed to be a process, not a form. Information exchange. We tell you what's going on. You tell us what's going on. So, we think, and we do think this, with uh, even though it's very controversial, innovations like Google Glass, 
and just other recording devices. It just how we're doing now. Just videotape the whole thing. We mean no one might ever have to look at that, but we're going to videotape it. If someday someone says, "Well, you didn't get consent," or the IRB wants to check and see, you know, who got consent, then we can pull some out and take a look at them. But, uh, but the idea is to, to stop worrying about the document and start worrying about the patient or the subject. <laughs> I mix up patient and subject too. I give people a hard time for that. But yes. So I, that's what I do first. Is get rid of that, and then I would then we sit down and talk again. Why are we doing this? Make sure everybody understands what the purpose of informed consent is, right? Because this person is doing something that they don't have to do. That's not for their own good. It at least makes sense. And, and we want to honor that too. We want to treat them like a person, huh? like a real person. And yes, that's can be seen as hard, but it actually is not. It is no less paperwork and. And again, we're at, we're at the time when setting up a video camera is, is a nothing thing. So that, that would be our, our, our number one thing. And our number two thing is you got to tell people what, what research is and what's treatment. Right? Yeah, this really is research and what research is and why it is. And why we want you and how we think it's going to come out, how it's going to affect you or not. So very, very basic, we're actually getting back to the basics of informed consent. What's material information? What would... What things might lead you to say no? I guess I've never been convinced that bioethics was a real field and it was going to be a real field. I'm still not. I understand law. I understand medicine. And I even understand philosophy, although it's a tiny field. But why do we need ethicists? What, are they, what, are they actually, what value added do they give? And I'm one. I mean, I'm, I can identify an ethicist. I say the same thing about myself. You know, you can say, well, you can fall back on law. That's true, but I mean, I really don't practice law. In that sense, so I really think about it. But, um, but I've never been persuaded that there's a real field there. There's, there's, a, there's a subject matter, like bioethics, <laughs> right? Ethics related to the biosphere. Okay, fine, all right, I get that. I mean, we got rid of that a long time ago, so we really just do medical ethics. I think most people would say that. Um, and, do we need someone who just does you know, more than the philosophers, like you know, that does ethics for the medical profession? I mean, they really should be doing mostly their own, their own ethics. I mean, I take Bob Veach's point that they're not experts on ethics because they're experts on medicine. Correct, you're right. You're right. But you know, do they need a whole profession to tell them how to be ethical? No. Do they need a few people, maybe? But it's more. It should be more of a hobby than a field. I mean, really. No, my, my guesses on this have been bad. In 1990, I said that the ethics committee would go the way of the pet rock and that we wouldn't have any more ethics committees. Turns out people love their ethics committees. They do exactly what they were doing in 1990. They do DNR, <laughs> healthcare proxies, and brain death. And after that, they just don't know what the hell, get people off the ventilators. But So I guess that, that fulfills a function. Although in the 90s, people were trying uh, to get off of ventilators. Now they're trying to get on them. Now people are very suspicious. You want to take things away from them. Whereas in the 90s, we, were, we wouldn't take things away from them. We want to get we got paid to keep treating them. Man. So, but anyway, yeah, I, I, I actually see bioethics going away, which is one reason why everybody was starting their master's in bioethics. We, I just refused to do it. We could have made a lot of money doing master's in bioethics, but I couldn't see what those people would do. And I still can't. I still think you need a, you need a PhD in philosophy if you want to do bioethics. So how do you think that the public could be better informed about the purposes oh, you could put of a period research. after that. How could the public be better informed? <laughs> God knows the answer to that, right? I mean, really. We have a public who consciously doesn't want to be informed. They really hate, I mean, the world is very, it seems very dangerous and awful to them. And the more they can stay within their own family and their own group, and their own re religion or whatever, their own groups, the happier they are. They have like no interest in looking at the other side or the other perspective. But yet, we oh. have this whole kind of race to the cure. You know, people are interested in scientific research, medical. There's a lot that you see more and more public writing, you know, writing in newspapers about medicine. There's a lot of interest in medicine. I think there's a lot of interest in research. But how do you... I'm interested in news that applies to you. 
Mm. That's what the interest is. How does, what does this mean for me? How has this changed my life? And I inhale bee pollen and will I live for longer? You know, I don't think I have any interest in these things in general. You know, they run for the cure because their sister had breast cancer or they have a friend who had breast cancer. They're not interested in breast cancer per se unless they're worried that they're going to get it. They're certainly not interested in pancreatic cancer. Or in, I mean, and even when you get two or three diseases that go to the top of the list. We've got all these other 150 of them on the bottom of the list and you can get no, no interest in it at all, right? I can't even remember what disease you dumped your bucket full of ice on your head, but nobody can get anybody else to do that. They will try it desperately or every other disease is trying to get some people to do something like that. That wasn't, that had nothing to do with disease. That had to do with networking and personality and getting your, your picture on a, out there on your, with your face page or your Facebook. No, I, I think you, you give the American public way too much credit if you think they're interested in, in science and disease. Well, no, actually what I'm really interested in asking Half is, of don't believe in evolution. is how they could be better informed <laughs> okay. about Al almost the any, Almost any way. <laughs> almost, any, almost any other way that we're doing it now. <laughs> No, I mean, this, it, obviously this brings us back to our grade schools and our high schools, which are abysmal. When you want to educate the kids, you got to start them. I mean, you probably got to start them in preschool. I actually now have a grandchild and I can see the world a whole different way. You do have to start them in preschool. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, you do. It's too late. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I just started teaching freshmen. I've never taught undergraduates my whole life. Four years ago, I started teaching this cohort of freshmen. And it's way too late to get there. <laughs> I mean, at least they're honor students and they can write, but, which is really nice because most kids, most of my medical students can't write at all. And they get like offended when you make them write a sentence. <laughs> it's like, no one told us we had to do that. <laughs> No, no, I mean, these are big questions, but these aren't questions that bioethicists are going to answer. These, yeah. are, these are big societal questions. Well, let's talk about you then a little bit more. If you were to look back at your younger self and have, have be an advisor to your younger self as an advisee, mm -hmm. um, what would you, what advice would you give yourself, your younger self? Same advice I did. Get out of Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in many ways, I love Minnesota. It's a nice place and all that stuff, but, you know, it's very isolating. The Midwest can be very isolating, even when it's nice. You know, the East Coast has its own problems. I mean, you know, we, especially in Massachusetts, we kind of think we're something like the rest of the country. We're like nothing like the rest of the country. <laughs> the rest of the country's like horrified at us when we go into all of them. Horrified at them, too. You know, so, but I guess the only advice is just travel more. Travel as much as you can. Meet as many different people as you can. And, when, and really, understand and it's a big, complicated world out there, and that we should take, try to, as the richest country in the world, we should try to take some responsibility for it, for more than just ourselves.